Um, it's brilliant to see so many people on this on this webinar. This is all, um, you know, like like all of us, it's all it's all new territory, and we're exploring the the different options for for um, having these sorts of events remotely. Um, so do bear with us if, um, if if there are a few sort of clunky bits around the edges. Um, but the idea for doing this um, this session arose partly from, from conversations that we've been having um, as part of a project that um, MOLA are undertaking and CIFA is a partner on to revise the um, 2008 Syria Construction Industry Research and Information Association publication um, called Archaeology and Development, a Good Practice Guide to Managing Risk and Maximising Benefit. And I don't know if you're all um, familiar with that, but um, it's, it's 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 a good publication, but it's due it's due a, a, a thorough um, revision and, and bringing up to date. And uh, one of our speakers today, Caroline Rayner, is on the project steering group um, for that project. Um, and it, I know there are a lot of the project team are actually are actually in here, so it's good to to see you all too. Um, and Caroline fed back as part of some of the early discussions um, on that work about some of the areas where better understanding would make for uh, a better working relationship between archaeology and, and, and the construction sector, um, which, which included some really interesting, some really interesting points and, and some things that had certainly not, not occurred to me um, previously. Um, and then at the same time, um, CIFA's Diggers Forum group has been working in partnership with, with others of our special interest groups to produce their series of 10 things we wished you knew, um, which, which if you haven't seen is, is on the CIFA website um, on the Diggers Forum page and I think probably on their social media pages as well. Um, and that so far that series includes 10 things graphic staff wish diggers knew, um, 10 things marine archaeologists wish diggers knew and 10 things diggers wish new starters knew which is which is a really good one and so it seemed obvious to bring them together into a CPD sort of discussion session really. Um, from the archaeology perspective we've also sought views from uh, responsible post holders and senior managers from registered organisations and um, although we don't have a presentation um, on that I've got um, I've got a list of things to add in um, at the end of the formal presentations, which we can we can feed in if they're not if they're not covered elsewhere. So thank you to anybody who's on here that that, that contributed to that. Um, I don't want to take up um, any more of the precious time, really. The main aim of this session is to identify um, and explore some of the areas where greater understanding would be beneficial. We're not claiming to have the answers at all. Um, so I hope that you'll find it useful as, as individuals and, and for your organisations. Um, and with the Syria team, a lot of the Syria project team here as well, I think there's a good opportunity to feed these discussions back into the, into the process of revising the Good Practice Guide. Um, Kerry's already said we'll be recording the presentations to make available on the CIFA website so you can share that with colleagues who aren't able to attend. Um, the recording of the discussion sessions is just, just for our note taking purposes so that we can make sure that we capture um, key issues and learning points which will, can also go on to inform our programme of communications with client sector bodies um, and also potentially feed into, into future CPD um, events. So um, we're lucky to have two presentations to start us off and to, to get the discussion going. I think many of you will know Caroline Rayner from Costain, who's presenting on the 10 things that the construction industry wishes we knew. Um, and we also have Martin Cooper here, who is um, archaeology and heritage consultant with McDonald and also on the Diggers Forum committee, um, who will tell us what diggers wish the construction industry knew about archaeology. So um, on that note, I will hand over to Caroline um, to start off with the, the presentation. Um, well, thanks very much for inviting me to talk today. It's really exciting to be able to um, have this discussion and also get the responses from people as well. So to hear the opposite side of the coin and talk about what archaeologists wish the construction industry knew. Um, I suppose I need to start with a introduction. I'm Caroline, I'm the project manager for Costain. 
Um, so I'm, I'm here talking as a representative of Costain and the construction industry, but I'm not here to represent the views of the entire construction industry. All I've done is solicit views and opinions from within my 3,000 people strong company across a range of um, different disciplines um, and ask them what they wanted to communicate. So I'm, I'm not here to represent the entire construction industry by any stretch of the imagination, just a viewpoint from Costain's corner of the world. And we do deal with archaeology on a lot of our sites, so something we're very familiar with. I am also an archaeologist, so I'm Costain's lead archaeologist, but for the purposes of this discussion, I'll be wearing my construction manager's hat, which is kind of my day-to-day -day job. So I run, run construction sites um, for Costain. Okay, um, so if we go to the first slide. Um, I think this is probably an obvious one, um, but we wanted to set it out in a slightly different language. So health and safety is, it's not something that is a good to have, it's not a nice to have, um, and it's not a, a principal aim or objective, it's a value, because fundamentally our, our values don't change. As people, we hold a set of values and they don't change, but priorities change which is why we try to step away from saying that health and safety is a priority. It's not a priority, it's a core value and it sits at the heart of everything we do in the construction industry. And it sits at the front of every statement and every document that we produce, regardless of whether or not that document or statement is actually about health and safety in the first instance. Um, and it also gets discussed in every meeting as well, so we have safety moments and value moments, that kind of thing. Um, it, it's something that we, we, we are clear, I hope we are clear when we invite people to, to tender for contracts and to be part of our team, that it is the most important thing. The fact that everybody comes to work and goes home safely every day at the end of every day is the number one driver. Yes, we need to build. Yes, we're here to construct. We're here to deliver a product. But safety is our, is our primary value. Okay, next slide. Uh, the next thing that came up was contracts in NEC. Um, and for those of you who are archaeological project managers or who work at any kind of commercial element of the industry, you're probably familiar with NEC 3 and 4 contracting. It's the new civil engineering contract. It basically forms the backbone of everything we do commercially nine times out of ten. Sometimes we do use different types of contracts, but it, it basically it's how we bring most archaeological contractors in, in as a subcontractor to our sites. Um, and we often find that we have a certain series of terms and terminology that are used that relates to NEC. Um, and if archaeology and archaeological project managers as a whole were able to um, experience and become more fluent in the language that is present in NEC, and it's a lot of books and it's very complicated and time consuming, frankly not always that interesting I'll be honest with you um, but if we were able to share a common language based around contracts at NEC it would give us an additional shared language to problem solve and you'll you'll see that shared languages is a theme and shared terminology is a theme that will will come out throughout the duration of this presentation and I hope this discussion because ultimately how we do things better is all about communicating effectively and not leaving any gaps or assumptions people assuming that something might happen or someone has understood something when in fact they may not because our languages and our, our terminologies are very different in two different worlds. Um, next slide please. Planning and programme is also something um, that is another language, it's another way of expressing our aims, our objectives, uh, our timescales and how we want to deliver works. And again, a lot of this is not always immediately communicated in the most direct way to archaeological subcontractors, but it sits within this overarching behemoth of a, a project program. Um, and we tend to use P6, Primavera 6. It's an expensive computer program to acquire and it's tricky to learn to use, um, but it's a very effective way of um, modeling activities, showing logic links, demonstrating how all the activities that happen on a construction site fit together and where archaeology sits within that wider framework of activities. Um, when we ask for archaeological plans, so um, by which I don't mean scale drawing, but actual plans of how the works will happen, um, a lot of the time these are presented in a way that isn't P6. And it means that they can automatically be aligned with our project program and lots of other stuff has to happen to allow people to understand this um, and sometimes information gets lost along the way because again we're not using that same, we're not using the same digital tools and we're not using the same um, 
common language and terms to express our needs, our wants, our aims and our requirements. Um, and so this is another great tool that allows, would allow the two disciplines where possible to have another common language for communicating. It's very benefit, beneficial to allow us to work collaboratively and look for innovation, look for time saving um, and allow us to deliver the best quality product to the clients, but also allow the construction team to get on with what they need to do whilst understanding how, when and why archaeologists need to do their work. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> I think one of the key things that I hope comes out of this is that actually a lot of construction companies and, you know, particularly costing, we actually like archaeology. Um, archaeology is often the highlight of our job, although it may not appear obvious from the facial expressions on many site managers' faces. Um, it's it's brilliant. We love having archaeological teams on site. You bring, it, bring such a great diversity of thought, attitudes and approaches. And, you know, we hope that you learn from us, but we also learn from you on a daily basis. And I can think I can speak for the, the team on HS2 enabling works in area south for Costain and Skanska. Um, they were thrilled to be able to speak to the archaeology team, ask them questions, understand why certain things happened, and to also share that learning and, and that, the joy of finding or discovering something for the first time. However, the reason we look like we don't like it on the outside is because we like to be able to quantify processes and procedures. And archaeology doesn't always fit into a box, which is easy to quantify. Um, and so people get a bit lost and a bit panicky when they start hearing that it's not possible to quantify a time scale. Um, also, our functions are very different. So your primary function, our primary functions are, are very different in the industry. You're, you're an enabler for us. You come in, work is carried out often great work, really high caliber research projects are delivered off the back of um, commercial archaeological works as well. Um, and a lot of learning goes out there, but then we have a whole other project life cycle behind what is delivered by the archaeological team. Um, and it goes far beyond the discharging of the archaeological requirements in the short to medium term. Um, so often our minds are, are one step ahead looking at something that's coming in, in the far distance that actually doesn't involve archaeology at all, which might account for the disgruntled looks on some people's faces. <laughs> okay, next slide please. Um, we want to help as well. Um, so the construction industry as a whole, particularly within Costain, we recognise that you are a very specific group of individuals with some very strong core skills um, and that basically we have access to um, a whole multitude of different supply chain groups who all do very specialist things for us. You do a job for Costain that Costain cannot do for itself. Um, and archaeological experts um, are often, I think, underrated, undervalued and, and under-recognised for the breadth and depth of skill that you have to have to deliver your job on site. Um, however, whilst you are highly skilled experts, sometimes the construction industry does things that would also benefit your industry uh, and we want to help. So when we see something happening that we think could perhaps be done slightly differently or more efficiently, um, or perhaps a change to your processes by bringing in new technologies that we have access to, um, we're not meddling, but we want to share the benefit of that experience and provide a fresh pair of eyes, even if those eyes don't belong to trained heritage and archaeological professionals. Next slide. Oh, sorry. No, that's great, thank you. Um, we also welcome a two-way dialogue. The, the aim of today is having a, a two-way dialogue between the industries. And, and as I think as a wider group, we'd, we'd welcome questions from you to us about how and why we do some of our works. Um, because as passionate as you are about explaining how and why archaeology works and what you found and what that means for a local or um, UK-wide archaeology strategy or research agenda. We're also quite passionate about what we do in the construction industry um, and we'd like a two-way dialogue about our work and the way we design things and how we do them and sometimes we design around archaeology, sometimes we design for archaeology and sometimes unfortunately archaeology is something that's found as a byproduct of the works where things haven't been planned properly in the first instance. But we'd like to talk about that because we think that would add value um, and it might allow you to understand a bit more about some of our more arcane activities on site and it's not really clear what we're up to or why we're doing it. Next slide please. 
Um, so survey is something as well that we spend a lot of time talking about and GIS and all those other um, digital elements and digital deliverables are becoming increasingly important. Um, you may have noticed on some of our, our linear route projects that we use different survey grids to you. Um, so when people get a bit baffled by being given stuff um, in OS data and somebody comes and asks if there's any other way or any other information, um, it's because actually we're asked often by our clients to align our our survey grid with a very different set of parameters than the OS. So sometimes it's localized to the project. Um, so we're not trying to be difficult or awkward, um, but often we will need to take your data, interrogate it, and basically then try and do conversions that make your data work for us. Or we might ask you to do some conversions that makes your data work for us. And that's our client's requirement. Uh, next slide, please. Environment and sustainability. Um, for those of you who know me um, and have worked with me on projects before, you'll know that I'm particularly passionate about um, innovation where it brings in environmental and sustainability benefits and efficiencies and safety benefits as well. But I think one of the real overlooked pieces in archaeology is that actually archaeological works can contribute quite markedly to some environment and sustainability processes on site. Um, archaeology is, is a means in its own right to a number of ends. Um, however, a lot of the activities that archaeology involves are actually quite carbon heavy and we're all thinking about carbon and the environment. So, and I know from talking to the teams from Headland, Mola, um, Wessex and various other groups that I've worked with over the years that, you know, for many people within your border team, sustainability is really high on your agenda. People always ask questions about what happens to the recycled material, what do we do with our reclaimed waste, do we, how do we manage things sustainably in construction, because construction is a very wasteful industry in a lot of areas. Um, but if you have any great ideas about how to make your work more sustainable, we would love to hear from you about it and work on that, whether there's a potential to be innovative or collaborative. From my own personal perspective, doing things like having early access to site to get decent um, soil data to know how we can sustainably place that material and reuse it elsewhere in the works rather than having thousands of lorries come to site and, and take it away and place it somewhere else. Sustainable placement is, is something that can be managed very efficiently and coordinated with the ecology and environment and archaeology teams to help add value and reduce carbon footprints of projects. Um, and I, I think there's a real value in thinking more widely about how we manage archaeology and archaeological works in a sustainable manner in the future. There's a bit of a gap there, perhaps. Okay, next point, number nine, please. Come back one. Um. Occupational health. Um, again, this is something that we've talked about on a number of sites recently. Occupational health is just as important as the safety and environment piece. So we talk about she, safety, health and environment. Um, but a lot of the time we focus very heavily on safety and environment and the health bit in the middle, which is you and me, the people doing the job, the works on site, doesn't get quite such a big shout out. Um, and when we see risk assessments and method statements, coming from the heritage and archaeology industries. And when we talk about this on site, it's also apparent that within the archaeology industry, occupational health gets slightly less um, airtime in some areas than perhaps safety and environment do. And so what we'd like to do is engage in a wider um, discussion about this and what we can do, because archaeology is a very physical job. It's very time consuming. There's a lot of manual labor. There's a lot of lifting, bending, carrying, reaching, um, being out in all weathers. Um, we know this and all of those things ha have occupational health impacts. So what can we do to support the occupational health component of archaeology and um, drive it to, to be better, to be safer, to be um, easier for the people who are carrying out the works? And then point number 10. Um, so for those of you who are big fans of Middle Eastern archaeology like myself, you recognise Jericho on the right hand side there, but this is just to illustrate um, research. Um, so a lot of the time people understand that archaeological work happens and construction teams see it happen on site. So they see people physically come to site, half section features, dig ditches, um, record, survey, photograph, use LIDAR and all sorts of other technologies. But a lot of the time they don't get a viewpoint on what that wider data collection is leading to or contributing to in a, in a wider world. And I think again, um, communicating that 
um, is really important. Uh, you do it very well, um, but unfortunately sometimes we, we're not great receptors perhaps. Um, and we are interested in what goes on on sites, um, what is found and what it tells us about human history in the past. Um, so perhaps working together to allow more information about the research that's being done at the same time that the archaeological works are being delivered um, would be beneficial to the site teams as well, because the more people we can interest in archaeology, um, the better we can deliver our works on sites and the more questions we ask and the more information we share, the better it is for everybody. Um, that's kind of my, that's my 10 things, I guess. That's, uh, so as a bit of a summary, I think a lot of it is around communication, how we align values and how we communicate information to eradicate misunderstanding, improve program and allow archaeological teams to do what they need to do, whilst also allowing the construction work to get done in a, in a commercial sense. Um, but hope that's been an interesting viewpoint um, and that information I've given you today came from project directors, health and safety people, occupational health, um, planners and the commercial team because those were all the people I solicited um, for opinions on, on what they'd like to know and what sort of things they'd like to have a dialogue on. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Caroline. That's uh, that was that was really interesting um, and, and lots of stuff to pick up in the discussion sessions. I think I'm going to move straight on to Martin Cooper um, to hear what ten things archaeologists wish the construction industry knew. If you've got um, burning questions, if you want to put them in the chat box um, at this stage, um, just in case you don't get a chance to, to to bring them up in the discussion session, please do that, and we'll try and capture as much as that as possible. If we can't um, discuss everything today, then we can then we can pick that up either in later events or or in the notes that we that we put out um, at the end of this. Hi, I'm Martin. I, I worked as a field archaeologist for uh, getting on for 10 years uh, before becoming a consultant. Um, I'm a member of the, I've been a member of the Diggers Forum Committee for two and a half years now. Um, and when, uh, given my position, um, I, I felt like it was the obvious choice to take this one on as, I, as it came up. Uh, I, I think from the previous slides, we'll see that a, a strong theme has been communication, and I hope that will come across in mine as well. I'd say uh, the biggest tricks for me putting this together uh, were to a not do it as a consultant, make sure I was writing from a digger's perspective, and b just trying to nail the audience down who, who exactly these are aimed at. I think there's a bit of a mix between people running construction sites overall and designing them and the people who are actually on site at the same time. So hopefully there's a bit of a balance between the two coming across in this. So if we can go to the first slide, please. Okay, so the first thing is everything we do on site is driven by the, the guidelines. It's um, in fact, everything before we go on site is driven by guidelines and regulations and all based on this stuff. Um, anything, anytime we come across something where we have to change it, uh, we, we discover something in that will change the way we have to do things. Anytime something comes up in the construction program that so we things need to move around a bit. Uh, it, we can't always just go, all right, we won't do that there, we'll do it over there instead. Um, it, it, it's Everything has to go through a series of checks and make sure that it all conforms to these uh, standards and guidelines. Okay. Uh, a lot of the time there's, uh, often from people on site, you, you get you know what you're looking for what what have you found and there you know people expect to find artifacts uh, burials things like, like that actual things you can pick up when sometimes it's not always that obvious you know it's 
ditches, pits, post holes, uh, and structures. Um, a lot, a lot of the things we find have no monetary value. We're not there trying to make money out of the things we find. It all goes to the museums, and it's yeah. Uh, um, so the, there's a, there's a lot of variation in what we do, what we find. Okay. Um, I mean, the, again, most of these things are from my own personal experiences or from those of my colleagues and, uh, and former colleagues. Uh, so we find that um, sometimes if you're working on a construction site, uh, the, the, the amount of PPE, the specific PPE doesn't really fit with what we're trying to do. Um, <laughs> that was something that was mentioned in, in the first one, um, but working together to develop health, uh, approaches to health and safety at an early stage is, is critical for everyone. Okay. And following on from that, um, there's often um, the flow of information between the archaeologists and the and the construction team. It doesn't always happen as as well as it perhaps should. Uh, and we there's a lot of information regarding health and safety that uh, we can discover by being the first people on site. Uh, not to mention any earlier things, geophysics and stuff like that, um, but also things that perhaps could have been flagged up earlier, but haven't haven't been because it, perhaps it, they, they just didn't occur to the first people who were out on site and planning the planning the construction scheme. Okay. So this, this is a popular one um uh, it's obvious when it is absolutely hammering it down with rain the snow on the ground it's not very safe to be out on site um i'll be on the, the picture that i've supplied for this one there was a point in on that early morning where you couldn't actually see any of the pits and the excavation that we'd done so you high likelihood of falling down a hole because you couldn't see it. Uh, it's also important to understand that, I mean, again, with that picture, you can see where people have walked across the archaeology and you can no longer see where it is and it, you can, can cause damage to the archaeology by going out in adverse conditions. Uh, and that's not always something that comes across. Oh, okay, sorry. Here I am. Again, um, this this is one where I stray slightly into my consultancy role, all, um, but also, and um, I mean, something that's been a lot better from when I started in archaeology uh, to now. That's something that vastly improved. Um, but also in, in, in the light of recent statements and other things, it, it is very much key that people understand we're not, we're, we're there to perform a role and to do our jobs. We are a necessary phase of construction and so long as it's planned right and so long as communication is continued, there's no reason we should uphold a program or cause any major issues. And this is uh, one that I put in myself, um, but we, was very keenly backed by other members of the Diggers Forum. Um, it's how we can promote it. Uh, HS2 does a very good job. Uh, I know Wessex do regular webinars and stuff showing what they found and how they found it and people actually talking about it. And the more we can push, um, these kind of things and the more 
archaeology can be good for development. It can really shine a positive light on what's going on um, and really have, you know, a, a good community, a good community, add good community value to the project as a whole. Um, so this one, uh, I think often more at those on site, uh, we, we, we work in a field that is not particularly well paid. Um, it, there's a misconception that because people have come through de degree programs and things that we are automatically on a higher wage. Uh, Whereas, um, again, has improved in the last few years. I mean, uh, five years ago, I was on substantially less than that. The what is now the minimum for site staff. As a supervisor, I was on substantially less than that. Um, however, you know, it, it's still at the lower end of things. We are quite often the lowest paid people on site, uh, and we, you know, when people complain about archaeology being expensive and things it's it, you know the, it's not that much in the grand scheme of things and yeah um and yeah sorry um also the, the short-term nature of sites the and contracts um job security you know as as we've seen recently multiple times in the past things can just stop very suddenly um, okay um, again communication coming up um, we you know it can seem like we are sitting in a ditch not doing a great deal and when we are actually recording every within uh, a lot of the processes can be quite slow and time consuming um, and we we are happy to explain them if people on site want to come down and ask what we're doing and why we're doing it um, then that's that's great because then we both understand each other and what we're trying to achieve okay and following on from that it is the as much as we can do a lot of digital recording now a lot of the uh the things we do to identify sites and and uh deal with sites are becoming more and more digital it's still always going to be a, a manual labor thing it's always going to be someone swinging a mattock and uh digging with a trowel and uh, um, unfortunately we're, it's highly unlikely we'll ever get to a point where we're we've got some machines or digital techniques we can use to entirely excavate and record things okay that's my ten thank you very much martin um I'm just looking through the, uh, the 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 list and also looking through the, the, the comments that are coming up in the in the group chat. Please do keep that coming because there's some really interesting um, points being made there, and we'll some of them are things that we can take up um, and and perhaps uh, come back to in in um, either in the report or or um, by other means. Um, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, we also asked, um, we, we sent a survey round to um, registered organisations through responsible post holders um, and we spoke to some, some individuals um, about that. One of the things we really wanted to do with this session actually was, was to pick out um, views from archaeologists on site, um, sort of on the ground as it were, and also for those um, potentially for those running running projects and and dealing at the uh, the more sort of project management end of things and I think it's interesting in terms of the communication comes out strongly um, across all of those um, so just picking out I won't read out all of the, uh, the the comments that we got but just picking out a few 
Um, there, were, there were quite a few comments about understanding archaeological project timeframes and risks, and particularly about um, the uh, archaeological project cycle being different to a construction project cycle. Um, also, uh, comments about um, investment upfront in preparatory studies um, and, and the potential of, of um, particularly in a planning context of predetermination, um, investigation, reducing and limiting risk, um, but also the point that, that even with the best um, the best uh, preparation and, and, and uh, predetermination information, the, the risk of unforeseen and unforeseeable discoveries can never be, can never be completely um, reduced. Uh, we had some interesting points about, about understanding the construction um, on the construction side, being properly informed about the nature of the archaeological works re required um, and, and where the obligation for archaeological mitigation actually rests. Um, and also understanding about the different competencies that that archaeological organisations and, and individuals will have. Um, there was a point about main contractors or developers, clients needing to satisfy themselves that they they have that their their archaeological um, subcontractors have the relevant competencies competencies for the for the tasks in hand and for the the sort of archaeology that that might be encountered. Um, what else did we have on here? Yeah, the, the, really interesting point about, about the need for better definition and articulation of the public value and public benefit within archaeological objectives. And I think that comes back to quite a few of the points that, 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 that Martin's raised about actually understanding what the point of the archaeological work is um, and that where that fits into um, a public value and public public benefit uh, framework. There were comments also about that archaeologists record buildings and don't just excavate holes in the ground, um, that geophysicists, if brought in early enough, can do more to facilitate planning and development than just um, service archaeological requirements, and, and also that uh, even even experienced consultants don't have a magic wand that can simply make the, project, the, the problem go away. Um, so I don't think I want to add too much more to that. Um, we, we will go into breakout rooms now and we can pick up some of these issues um, in discussion. It might just take a little while to get everybody sorted into their, their various groups, so do bear with that. And then when we come back, um, one of the things, one, well, there are two things really that we want to, to think about in terms of, of feeding back. Um, which are really the sort of the, the, the key learning points in a way. So um, in terms of what you've what you've heard and, and, and the discussion we've had, what what will you take away from it and what, what might you do differently and what what can CIFA do um, to uh, to to improve that understanding and in, in terms of our, our client sector communications um, to, to facilitate that better understanding between the construction sector and, and archaeology. So I'm going to hand over to Kerry to put everybody into groups and I will hopefully see some of you um, in, in a breakout room shortly. <laughs>